Um, our next speaker is Andrew White from the CSIRO Biosecurity Flagship. Um, Andrew um, has been working on field-based research projects and joined CSIRO in 1989. He moved from Canberra to Brisbane to join the very successful biological control of water hyacinth project in uh, Papua New Guinea and has since worked on numerous biocontrol and weed ecology projects including the field validation studies of several invasive weeds for the Murray-Darling Basin modelling project impact studies of the smut fungus for the control of mist flower and ecology studies of mesquite and the assessment of the associated biocontrol agents. He's currently involved in the evaluation and introduction of biocontrol agents for Parkinsonia. Please welcome Andrew White. Thank you and thank you for allowing me to stand up here and talk today. Uh, it's not something I really enjoy doing but we think we have something worth talking about. I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors, two of which are here today. Uh, Kelly has a couple of posters on display, one of which is the work being done here in Queensland with UU, and Geo has the display out the back which you would have seen and which I'll expand on. And we want people to know all about UU and UU too, because after speaking at several field days, I understand there's a real enthusiasm and optimism about these two new insects released the biocontrol program on Parkinsonia. And biological control has an important role to play in the long-term management of many serious weeds in Australia. Parkinsonia is a weed of national significance and it's been a target for biocontrol since the early 1980s. In this presentation, we'll have a quick look at the plant itself and the threat it poses. Then I'll give you an update on the agents that have been released in the past, the current work we are doing and what possibilities there may be for the future. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank MLA for their ongoing funding and the in-kind contributions from state and regional organisations. Parkinsonia is native to the Americas. It was introduced in the late 1890s and early 1900s for its ornamental value, where it was grown in towns and as a shade tree around homesteads and boars. Now it's a serious weed in northern Australia, where it invades semi-arid and tropical rangelands. It is a declared class two pest in Queensland, and as I've already mentioned, it's a weed of national significance. Parkinsonia is a typical uh, prickle bush, probably not the worst of them. It grows as a shrub or small tree, usually two to six metres high. It has particularly good looking bright yellow flowers, which is where it gets its ornamental value. And it has sharp spines at the base of long slender compound leaves and seeds that are contained within elongated pods. These seeds float, which is one of its main forms of spread. Parkinsonia can form dense thickets that have a negative effect both on the environment and the pastoral industry in rangeland Australia. Native grasses are impacted, it outcompetes native trees and shrubs, and it destroys wildlife habitat resulting in the loss of biodiversity. It can choke water courses and impede access to water, it damages soil structure, contributes to soil erosion, it makes mustering difficult, and provides a refuge for feral animals. It currently occupies approximately one million hectares of land across northern Australia. As for its potential distribution, the Climax model suggests it's very suited to establish itself throughout large areas of northern Australia. As is typical of a serious weed, there is no one method or best practice to manage Parkinsonia. Every site and infestation is different. However, there is a range of tools and techniques available to contribute to an integrated management strategy. Biological control is just one of those tools. Classical biocontrol is the introduction of the plant's natural enemies to achieve sustainable weed control by reducing growth, reducing the reproductive capacity and reducing life expectancy. The aim is to suppress the greater population and restrict or limit its potential. The Australian Biological Control Program commenced in 1983. It was a joint project between government agencies from Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australia. Native range surveys were principally carried out in the USA and Northern Mexico in the mid-1980s. Three insects were identified as potential biocontrol agents. These were imported into quarantine by the Queensland government for further testing and later approved for release. The mirrored rhinocloa was first released in 1989. Feeding on the leaves and shoots results in tiny white spots where photosynthetic tissue is destroyed. In its native range, very high populations have been observed to cause distortion of growth and prevent flowering. 
This has not been previously documented here in Australia. However, Kelly and Judy have observed this growth distortion during recent surveys in Queensland. The second insect release was a seed feeding brucid Mimosestes in 1993. Females overposit on almost mature and mature pods on both the tree and the ground. Young larvae enter the seed pod where their development is completed by feeding on the mature seed. This has the potential to contribute to the destruction of Parkinsonia seeds. However, this has not been observed in the field for over 10 years now, despite intensive and widespread sampling. Another seed feeding brucid, Penthobrucus, was released in 1995. Like Mimosestes, larvae complete their development within the pods feeding on the developing seed. These round exit holes are the most obvious indication of their presence. This brucid is particularly widespread in Queensland and is responsible for destroying up to 30% of the annual seed production. So with a greater understanding of the invasion history of Parkinsonia through genetic studies, CSIRO undertook expansive native range surveys further south in Central and South America beginning in 2002. 350 insect herbivores and one pathogen species have been identified in its native range. Of these, 145 had reliable host association data and 12 species were prioritised for further evaluations. Other species, other species were rejected for reasons of rarity or just lack of potential impact. Another three were rejected during host testing and now five species have been approved for release, including the three I've just gone through. UU Pathesius Spotensis, which we named UU for obvious reasons. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's a leaf-feeding geometrid moth from Argentina. It's also known as a looper due to the way the larvae loop their body when they move. As we were nearing the completion of testing, we received a follow-up shipment of UU from Argentina to freshen up our colony in preparation for release. This shipment turned out to include a second species. Specimens from this shipment were sent to the Bavarian State Collection of Zoology in Munich <coughs> for taxonomic purposes, and this is where this second species was diagnosed. And so we have U. Pathesia species 2, or UU2, which we formally imported into quarantine as well for testing, and both species proved highly specific and were approved for release. The molecular evidence indicates that UU2 is a distinct species from UU. However, it's really difficult to tell these two species apart. External morphology and behaviour of both the adults and larvae are very similar. We can only definitively tell them apart by slide mounting and observing their genitalia through a microscope. Both species have a very similar life cycle. Adults emerge, mate and eggs are laid within one to two days. The eggs take approximately a week to hatch. The larval development takes another two weeks. Then they pupate for another week and all starts again. Damage to the plant is caused during this larval development stage with the larvae feed on the leaflets and the leaf stalks. This feeding damage can result in defoliating the plant. This reduces the plant's ability to photosynthesize, impacting on the health of the plant, reduces growth and reproductive output, and makes it more susceptible to disease and other forms of control. So we went back to Argentina to get a better understanding of the two species. Armed with our high-tech field equipment, we travelled north from Buenos Aires and up through the provinces bordering Uruguay and Brazil to the east, and Paraguay and Bolivia in the north. These are locations where previous collections had been made. Countries like Argentina aren't, are not the easiest places to work in. Collections are mostly from the roadside due to difficulty accessing properties. Provinces are individually governed and permits are required for collections and transporting through border checkpoints and these are becoming increasingly more difficult to get. But what we found was distinct locations where each species was collected. There was no mixing and no overlap. This has influenced our release strategy of the two species in Australia. In Queensland, where the largest releases have been made to date, we have tried to match release locations with the climate that each species appears to have adapted to in its native range. Based on this rationale, U was being released in the more coastal Parkinsonia infestations and sites to the east of the Great Dividing Range, and UU2 is being released in the drier and semi-arid regions to the west of the Great Dividing Range. Our aim is to establish self-sustaining populations in key areas across northern Australia. Releases are being made on the healthiest Parkinsonia plants available. 
However, plant quality differs from site to site and season to season. Poor quality plants, poor plant quality and predation from ants, spiders and wasps are factors which must be overcome to achieve establishment. To combat this, the establishment of nursery sites is seen as a vital strategy. Rather than one-off releases at numerous sites, the aim of the nursery sites is to generate multiple releases and flood the sites with large numbers of insects until establishment is achieved. Insects are mass reared in Charters Towers in Darwin for UU and in Brisbane for UU too and shipped out to collaborators where we have a coordinated release effort across northern Australia with state and regional agencies. UU was first released in Western Australia in late 2012 and in Queensland and the Northern Territory in 2013. Over half a million larvae and nearly 140,000 pupae of you have been released to date, with about 80% of those occurring here in Queensland, and that's thanks to the huge effort of Kelly and Judy at the Tropical Weeds Research Centre in Charters Towers. UU2 was first released in Queensland and Western Australia in October 2014, and releases in the Northern Territory will commence in 2016. So far, 140,000 UU2 have been released in the first year. Firstly, we must establish self-sustaining populations that can overcome predation, poor plant quality, flooding and whatever else is thrown at it. But already we believe we have you established at 18 sites in Queensland, although I see on Kelly's post where it says 20, three in the Northern Territory and possibly one in WA. Once established, we're looking for natural spread and already we have encouragement finding you up to several kilometres away from some release areas. <coughs> Excuse me again. Uh, monitoring for UU, U2 establishment and spread will commence shortly. As for impact, well, only time will tell. Biocontrol agents typically take many years to establish and build up populations to the level required to inflict detectable damage to the target population. But by reducing growth, reducing the reproductive capacity and reducing life expectancy, we hope to suppress the Parkinsonian population and restrict its potential. Once it's established, there's no ongoing costs. It should always be there and it will find new outbreaks and infestations by itself. As for the future, ideally we, with a biocontrol program you want to introduce a number of different agents. Seed feeders, leaf feeders, stem borers, sap suckers, gore formers, pathogens. Each have their own little niche on the target plant doing their own thing that combined overall has an impact. Neolasiopra is a gore former from Argentina. Nutrients are diverted into the gores, which results in gross distortion and reduction in flowering and seeding. We imported this into quarantine while we were testing the ewes, but it proved really difficult to culture. And we didn't have the resources to really give it a good go, but this is one that we're very keen on, one for the future, if funding becomes available. Another for the future is the stem borer from Mexico, Hafatulena. Feeding within the stems disrupts the nutrient path, causing a stunning of growth and can also result in stems snapping off, again resulting in a reduction of flowering and potting. This was also important to quarantine and also proved difficult to culture. We did have some success, but due to limited time and resources, we were unable to get the culturing to a point where we could start testing. Rudinia, a moth also from Mexico, and we thought this was our silver bullet. It was easy to culture, and it was so devastating to Parkinsonia, we had trouble keeping plants up to it. Testing was going well and we were getting very excited until it took a bit of a liking to some of our native plants and was therefore rejected. But perhaps there is another Rodinia out there somewhere that is a little more fussy with what it feeds on. Thank you. <laughs> and, I'd also, and I'd also like to thank everyone out there who's helping to get these control agents out and about and established in the field. If there are any other organisations, agencies or landcare groups who want to be involved, just please be in touch. Thank you.